Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Parks, Arts, Education, and Equality Subcommittee. Today is April 25th, 2018. I am uh, calling this meeting to order. Uh, I have a call to a public, and it's uh, Alexa Nunez. Uh, 4817 North 93rd Drive. I said your address. I'm sorry. Alexia. Sorry, I uh, did something that I shouldn't have done. But no, you're fine. Uh, I had gum in my mouth. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Parks Board Education Meeting, um, the subcommittee. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak to you today. I'm here as a long-term uh, long resident of the West Valley. Um, sorry, my public speaking. It's been... A, it's been a while. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm here as a long-term resident of the West Valley and have deep concerns regarding our public library, Desert Sage. Uh, recently, we've learned as a community that there's a proposed medical marijuana um, dispensary asking for a use permit within 200 feet of our library. Um, when I learned this, I contacted my grandmother, Eve Nunez, who's been a longtime advocate and pastor in the West Valley. Um, she suggested that I attend this sub-meeting and uh, ask for your help. My grandmother also helped me prepare a petition, which I'd like to read um, and submit to the committee today with what we are asking for as a community. She apologizes for not being able to be here. Um, she's currently traveling on the East Coast. Um, before I uh, read this, I'd like to thank you uh, for all your hard work in our community. Um, uh, Pastor, I um, am a little bit aware of your background that you attended St. Mary's. I also, too, am an alum alumni, so, you know, once a I night, always a night. These two, we're a night. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to read the petition, just what I would like to submit. Um, whereas this uh, Phoenix City Library System is an asset uh, to the community, must be supported and protected. Whereas the City of Phoenix Zoning Ordinance has distance requirements for medical marijuana dispensaries, to wit that a dispensary should, be located, should not be located within 1,320 feet of a public community center. The City of Phoenix Zoning Ordinance defines a public community center as a building owned by the city that is open to the public and is used for a place of meetings, recreation, and social activities that may have out, uh, outdoor re recreational facilities. Whereas the City of Phoenix public libraries are owned by the City of Phoenix, open to the public, and used for meetings, recreational, and social activities. Meetings, recreation, and social activities held at a branch libraries include uh, sedition preparation meetings, story time, and music events for children. Um, whereas the City of Phoenix signage at branch libraries state that the purpose of a library includes attending library or com uh, community-sponsored programs and meetings. Is that my... Okay. <laughs> Among other things, meetings held at the library for citizens' preparation for um, patrons who wish to pursue their citizenships. In addition to the books, magazines, and audio materials available, other social and recreational activities involve Lego and board games. Pursuant to Chapter 4, Section 22 of the Phoenix City Char Charter, I, Alexi Nunez, a citizen re a resident of Phoenix, hereby petition the City Council to consider an act within 15 days of a resolution, ordinance, or measure that um, authorizes a city manager or, or his designees to request an informal interpretation of the zoning code on the point which I have identified and to instruct all City of Phoenix staff and hearing officers that the public library meets a code definition of a public community center and um, a medical marijuana dispensary uh, should not be allowed within 13, uh, 20 feet of use without a variance. I further request that the all zoning cases um, in which the question is implicated whether a variance must be obtained regarding a distant requirement from the public city library. To wit, does a library constitute a public community center to be held in abeyance until this matter is resolved? Okay, I will, uh, Patty, I need some guidance this is a petition, and usually and I, and we I, accept yeah, I have citizen stuff to petitions submit. at the council meeting. So I'm not really sure it's being submitted to a subcommittee. And if we could, I, I, what I will do uh -huh. is because we're, uh, I would say, a little caught off guard. Yeah. In the uh, sense uh, of, I will uh, take the petition. I will okay. hand it over to Patty. Legal okay. will make a decision as to how we move this petition. And uh, will you contact her? Uh, yes, M Madam Chair, I will do that. Um, but there also is a process for um, a zoning interpretation. Okay. And that may be the proper um, method for accepting this petition rather than it being a petition to the council. 
But now that we have a petition in front of us, we I have to go know, through yeah. the process probably. So we'll get so, that legal advice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess mm -hmm. hand it to us, and okay. then from there we will go through a like process a to chain. see where where it technically goes or how we how we operate. Okay. And uh, because this first time it's been submitted to a subcommittee. Okay. And uh, that's we probably was a little bit. She was a little bit confused. She had just told me look on the meetings, you know, oh. go there, kind of just start from there. Right. And that's no problem. Go up. It's no problem. It's always a learning curve for every one of us. Yep. And so uh, that's what we'll do. We'll accept it. Then we'll uh, get a legal interpretation. Thank and uh, someone from legal will contact you to okay. tell you uh, what the next steps are. And okay. then they'll have to let us know what our next steps are. Gotcha. So uh, thank you for submitting it. Uh, okay. I do know that your mom's been obviously in Washington. She's yeah. over there in Washington. She's doing a lot of work over there. Her. Oh, yeah. It's, it's fun. It's fun watching. And your grandma. Yes, yes. And you do look like her. <laughs> <laughs> this is the red lipstick. I get that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, can we, they make sure that we get yeah. information back also? I'm, a, I'm assuming they'll let all of the council know all right, perfect. what to Thank do. You. That's a big assumption, but yes, I will uh, make that request. Uh, item number one is minutes of the meeting, uh, March 14, 2018. Do I have a motion? I move to approve. Second. Uh, there's a, um, a, for, a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, consent action items, uh, items two through four. Are there any questions? If not, uh, is there a motion? I will move to approve the consent action items two through four. Motion to approve. Okay, there's a, oh, a, mo second. a second I mean, motion sorry. and a second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, item five is information only. Does anybody want to uh, know the Head Start monthly report for February 2018? Everything's good. Okay. We are uh, now on item six. Uh, item six is about the status of excess parkland uh, unencumbered by Phoenix Parks and Preserves Initiative fund repayment. Uh, I asked for this item to... Uh, I asked for some uh, background work to get started and then to put this item today. Inger. Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, I'm here today with Tim McBride, who's, who's the real estate administrator, uh, to tell you the current status of the uh, property that we have that is considered excess. And I'll turn it over to Tim for the presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction, Inger. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson Pastor, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk about excess parklands that can be sold to help repay the Phoenix Parks and Preserve Inif Initiative, or as we like to call it, 3PI. Uh, to get started, here's a little background on the 3PI repayment. Back in 2013, City Council took action in response to ongoing deficits associated with City of Phoenix golf courses. That action was to direct staff to use about $15 million in funds uh, from 3PI to address the deficits and preserve uh, Phoenix Municipal Golf. Uh, fast forward to 2017 in July, City Council passed an ordinance uh, directing staff uh, to return proceeds uh, from the sale of unencumbered parkland to 3PI for the next five years or until that $15 million was repaid, whichever comes first. Since that ordinance was passed, the city has completed the sale of two park parcels and their proceeds, about 1.7 million, have been transferred to the 3PI fund. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Department has identified an additional eight excess parcels whose funds are unrestricted and could be applied to 3PI. Oh, I lost a map. Uh, I've used the term unrestricted, so I just wanted to clarify what that is. A parcel is considered unrestricted when there are no strings associated with the type of funds uh, that are, were used to acquire the land originally. Uh, the city park lands have been acquired over time through a variety of funding methods, uh, general obligation bonds, water bonds, special impact fees, and federal grant programs such as community development blo block grants and the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Many of these funding methods impose restrictions on how the proceeds can be used if the properties are sold. However, there are some parklands that were purchased with general obligation bonds that have been repaid, 
or uh, they were donated to the city by private individuals with no restrictions. Parcels such as, the, as these are considered unrestricted. Uh, just this, this is kind of a bird's eye view of where the eight uh, different parcels are located across the city, and we'll take a quick tour of those. Um, this is the first one. Uh, it's uh, undeveloped parkland, about 10 acres near Stetson Loop and Happy Valley Road in Council District 1. The next parcel is five undeveloped acres on the north end of Rosemoffer Park. That's at uh, Peoria and 25th Avenues in Council District 3. This parcel is currently under contract with the buyer, and we hope to have it closed by mid-June. Next, we head out to the Camelback Ranch uh, Spring Training Area. This is near 107th Avenue and Camelback Road in Council District 5. This vacant land is about 14 acres and was recommended for disposal uh, via broker by the Sustainability, Housing, Efficiency, and Neighborhood Subcommittee last month. So pending uh, approval by the full council and appraisal, this one should be on the market by summer. Also in D5, uh, we have 15 acres of undeveloped land. This is near 95th Avenue and McDowell off the 101. Switching over to Council District number seven, we have 12 acres of undeveloped parkland at 79th Avenue and Thomas Road. Also in D7, uh, Parks has a small lot, just about a fifth of an acre. This is at 20, uh, 3725 West Sherman Street. D7 also has some open land adjacent to Cuban Park near Buckeye Road and 31st Avenue. An RFP process was completed on this lot, but there were no bidders. Uh, the final of the eight properties is also in D7. This is a small commercial building and some land at Woodland Park near 9th Avenue and Van Buren Street. So next, Inger will describe uh, the, uh, the decision process that the Parks and Recreation Department follows before disposing of properties. Thank you, Tim. Oh, sure. Again, uh, as you may remember from previous conversations, uh, we have a, uh, a five-step process that involves going to the community um, after someone has expressed interest. Uh, we do require that the person who's expressed interest do all the processes, uh, go to the community twice for two public meetings, go to the Village Planning Committee, but then also come back to the Parks and Recreation Board. And then after that, they'd go to the subcommittee and to the full council for disposal if, if we got that far. At any point, the process can be stopped if it's deemed that the community doesn't really want to sell the property and they would rather keep it as a, a, a vacant parcel until such time that we have the funding to not only build it, but operate it. Uh, and with that, um, we'd answer any questions. So um, this item, I asked uh, Phoenix uh, Parks and Rec's director to meet with each council person uh, regarding the parcels that were uh, could possibly go up for sale. Inger, what was the response? Because I don't want to step on anybody's toes as we move forward. Uh, so last week, uh, I gave all the parcels to um, the various council districts, um, and I have not heard back from any one of them that they are not interested in at least going to the community and considering okay. uh, a conversation about what they want to see happen with that property. OK. Uh, Councilman Nalkowski, you have uh, three properties. Actually, four. Four? Yeah. OK. <laughs> so um, the one on 79th Avenue and and Thomas, um, there's two schools there, so we'd really like to maybe reach out first to the schools to see if they're even interested or what would they like to see right behind their schools. Um, actually, the one on 9th Avenue and Van Buren, it's that little strip mm -hmm. on the um, south side of um, Van Buren. Okay. So we have um, University Park, so right across the street from University Park, oh, there's that little strip. strip. Yeah. Of trees and some green space. So there's um, there's some interest, different people. One person wants a parking lot for maybe a potential theater nightclub. Others would like a dog park. So I think that's something that we've been working on the Van Buren. We have a committee of individuals that um, we're trying to bring that up to, to life, sort of create a, a Roosevelt Row atmosphere down there. So I'd like to have some time to maybe meet with the community on that one. But the um, Sherman Park, um, the Sherman, right off of um, 37th Avenue in Sherman, 
it looked like it was a residential area at one time. So I was just wondering if we know what the zoning is for that. And the only concern that I heard from individuals is that it wouldn't be some type of um, commercial property or anything like that. It would uh, fit the character of the neighborhood. Madam Chair and uh, Councilman Nalkowski, uh, our belief is that, um, and it is zoned residential, but our belief is that that would probably be just an infill house is okay. really what that would be. And that has, I have no problem with that then. And then the um, the Buckeye and 31st Avenue, the um, we actually sent that out to um, to a bid and nobody actually were interested in the RF RFP on that one. So the school is very interested. It's actually a gateway into our um, park, Cuban Park. Um, they were just wondering if there's some kind of a long-term agreement or IGA with the city that we can make and they would love to build a parking lot where it can be accessible to their community center and at the same time to the park itself, uh, if Madam, that's possible. Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Nowakowski, we are actually were working with the previous administration and there's been an administration change right. and so we just need to go back. Um, we were trying to uh, see if they were interested in the IGA and at the time the current, the previous administration wanted to purchase it outright. Right. Um, but I think we might be able to go back and just see if they're willing to enter into a long-term IGA. It benefits us from the Parks Department because then it is access and it's additional parking. So it's a, it's, it would be a win-win if that's the way we can go. And then the um, the other property that's right there at Margarita Park, is that, I know that was on, the, it, I didn't see it on the map, but it's I actually talking um, about that. That, yeah. that property is actually a property that is uh, the school district's property. Right. Um, and we're working with them on that as well. Okay, thank you. So my question on the long-term lease, would then that uh, funding then go into the 3PI? Uh, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, if it was a, a lease purchase or if it was an IGA, it would just probably be a nominal fee because we would share parking. Um, but any monies that were acquired from these properties would go back to the repayment. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Okay. And Mrs. Chair? Yeah. I was just wondering if you can give just like a quick brief of how we came up with these five steps because I was on, I was actually on the council when that happened so uh, madam chair and um, uh, councilman Nowkowski the five steps are actually a parks board policy mm -hmm. and it used to be eight steps and so they asked us if we could go back and try to shrink it to make it a little bit more palatable for anybody who's interested in in purchasing the um, the property and so working with um, the, the Parks Board and working with uh, the folks who were instrumental in creating the policy to begin with, uh, we were able to uh, reduce the amount of time it took and reduce the amount of steps to five steps from eight. So in theory, it should take less time than it, the eight step process. So I guess once we take an action, looking at these steps, what's the possibility of us seeing it at council? So, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members of the subcommittee, what, what I would expect is we first want to take the pulse of the community. Is this something you're interested? And then we would put a sign on the lot that says this property is for sale, and we would see if we could get interested people to go through the process. Oh, go ahead. So if we made some type of motion, it would still involve the council district being a, an mm -hmm. important part of the process. And the village planning committee as well, okay. yes. All right. Thank you. I just want to make sure. So where in that process does it speak about community um, involvement or community outreach? So Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, the, the sign gets posted. Then the first thing is we go to the Parks Board and say we're going to put this, we've put this on the market. The first step is that we go have two public meetings with the community. And that's the very that's the very first step after the the parks board says go forward which they've already said by putting it on the list okay so the letter of intent uh, feasibility analysis has already happened no that would come that would come after the community says we're interested in doing this and there's a checklist that we have that goes through and says where are the closest parks um, what kind of amenities uh, are around so technically it's not five steps it, it is. It, I mean, what I'm saying yeah, is, you, public yeah, outreach. yeah, exactly. Well, again, so that, the, the first step should be public outreach. And that is something and we're adding. And then the second yeah. step should be later, whatever, so, the, whatever so, the next step is. Madam, Madam Chair and uh, members of the subcommittee, 
the, the community outreach first is something we've added because we want to make sure there's interest. Because normally people approach us. We start. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we typically start with somebody giving us a letter of intent that right. they want to purchase the property. We then go out to the public and take a pulse. Because you all are asking us to go check with the public, we're first going to check with the public, post it. If we then have a letter of intent and interest, then we start the process. We're doing the public piece earlier because you're asking us to go see if we can dispose of these properties. Typically, they come to us interested in the property. OK, so for lack of confusion, okay. uh, next time we do this, I think what we need to do is first public comments or public uh, outreach. Then once that's done, whatever the decision is, then the five step comes into play. Can do. That's what I'm thinking. Am I off? <laughs> Madam Chairman, of the subcommittee, no, except that this is the approved five-step process right. by the Parks Board. Right. We're doing a public process outside of that, an extra step. Okay, so it. if we added it, we'd be adding to the approved five-step process <laughs> that they've approved. I, I think, okay. But for so clarity purposes. For clarity purposes, I think the slide before should probably be okay. community outreach. First piece Absolutely. that we do when we uh, decide to. Uh, sell some property. Thank you. Go ahead. Madam Chair, on the second point, it says public notification. It doesn't say two public notifications or anything like that. Is it spelt out in the policy or is it? Yes, and I believe you have the policy in your um, packet uh, where it is actually spelled out. Let me okay. get to that. I just want to double check that. So step one is the letter of intent. Step two is public notification, which includes um, two meetings, minimum two meetings, and then we report back to the Parks Board, then to the subcommittee, and then to the City Council. And in these public notification of step two, it's actually Village Planning Committee as well. All right. Thank so, you for all the clarity. Yeah. So could I try to make a motion here? Yes. Go and ahead. <laughs> I, I know most of them are in District 7, so correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> Councilman. So can we direct staff to move forward with conduct, conducting an initial public outreach, which would, of course, involve the council, to gauge the community's interest in selling the five underdeveloped excess park parcels for some other use? And those would include the number one parcel, which was Stetson Loop and Happy Valley Road, parcel four in your map, which was 95th Avenue and McDowell Road, uh, five, which was 79th Avenue and Thomas Road, six, 3725 West Sherman Street, and number eight in our maps was 9th Avenue and Van Buren Street. And this would just begin the initial process, and then we'd see if we get letters of intent, and we make sure the council is very much involved in it. That would be my motion. I hope I didn't confuse everybody. No, no, I'll second okay. that. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, little item seven. 2018 water safety and awareness efforts. Uh, this is very important as the summer has, uh, maybe say spring, but I believe it's summer now. <laughs> All right. Kids are in water, at least my kids are. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, today I have uh, Division Chief uh, Daniel Cheatham and Aquatic Supervisor Becky Hewlett, who will be providing uh, the report on the joint efforts uh, between the Fire Department and the Parks and Recreation Department uh, in water safety. Thank you, Director Erickson, Madam Chair, subcommittee members. Uh, as we all know, Arizona annually leads uh, with water-related emergencies, um, beautiful weather, good economy. Uh, which is why I think this presentation, you'll see why our partnership between aquatics and our efforts and our messaging, why it's so important. Some quick stats that you see up there. Uh, last year, 2017, uh, in Maricopa and Pinal County, we had uh, 55 water-related incidents, eight adult fatalities, and six pediatric. And up until, from January of this year till April, you see we have uh, seven uh, related incidents, one adult, and three pediatric fatalities. What you don't see up there is since 2011 to 2017, we've seen a downtick 
in those emergencies despite the growth of the valley. And I think that uh, directly correlates to our messaging and our efforts, which we'll talk more about um, here. So uh, what I'd like to do is have Becky uh, talk about our SOS program, which is part of that messaging. Good morning. Thank you for having me here this morning. I want to talk real quick about our SOS program. Back in 2014, we were tasked with putting together this mm -hmm. program by uh, the mayor and city council. And we created this water safety initiative program that is a in-depth curriculum on water safety to take out to the community. In 2016, we were able to go out and train our community members and train some trainers. We taught over 600 people in our community this great curriculum. What we're doing now is we are taking this curriculum, we're going to make it available, make it more accessible to our community by putting it on our website in the Parks Department. It will have its own page to host the PowerPoint for anybody to be able to uh, get to it as well as the videos. We also use the messaging from our SOS program in all of our water uh, safety events. The resource guide that you have in front of you is something that we also are able to hand out to our community members to give them some information. April Pools Day. Uh, th that took place on March 29th uh, this year. And what it is, it's our annual water safety kickoff event. Um, the city of Phoenix is the leader in the valley, so we try to have our event first. Um, as leaders and what it is it's a media event it's a chance for them to come out there they get to see an actual mock drowning with ems response and everything and a lot of them uh, use that as hits in there in the news so it's awareness there we had news agencies and pios live streaming it and plus i have to give credit to aquatics they picked the perfect day spring trainings in town so the resort is packed so people from out of town who don't have the awareness in their state of water related, they get that messaging and they take it back. So it's just a great water safety kickoff event. Uh, another one is our wave walk. That's coming up May 1st. And because, and that's led by the fire department, but it takes a village, all of our partners, aquatics. Um, but we are, tend to be reactive to emergencies. And this is a chance for us to proactively go out there and protect the public. So we pick a, uh, this one will be off of Thunderbird and 51. We pick an area about 1,000 homes, and we have volunteers, firefighters, all of our uh, partnerships, DBAC, Safe Flag Aquatics, and we all go out there and we take this SOS messaging, these door hangers that have the nuts and bolts, the ABCs of water safety, but it also, uh, and they're in English and Spanish, but they also have almost a checklist so you can water, waterproof your home. And so we go out there and we canvass the neighborhood, and that's just one of the uh, many ways that we proactively protect the public with this partnership. So at our pools uh, throughout the summer, we, we work with Cigna Healthcare. They've been a longstanding partner for us, and they provide us the opportunity to educate our youth in our communities. We, we serve over 1,000 people, 1,000 kids in our communities in these different programs, Cub Club, Discovery Guard, Junior Lifeguard, and Lifeguard Academy, really reaches those kids that are 7 to 16 years old that are interested in water safety and it gives them a place to go these this is free of charge for these kids and it's a way to again educate uh, our, our community on water safety awareness um, we also offer swimming lessons at all of our pools we are getting ready for registration which will take place tomorrow so we offer over eight 18,000 swimming lessons in the summertime at the City of Phoenix pools. Last year we had uh, sev over 17,000 participants that uh, took these classes and learned how to swim, which is one of our layers of protection against drowning and really an important piece aspect of what kids need to learn as well as adults. We have a lot of adults in our community that do not know how to swim that also need to learn how to swim as well. We work with the Diamondbacks. Uh, they provide us funding that allow us to continue swimming lessons in the month of August. Thanks to their sponsorship, we, we are able to offer another thousand swimming lessons in the month of August, and we're able to discount all of those lessons to $3 for everybody at all of the 11 pools that are open throughout our entire community. Uh, water safety events and education. Uh, Again, aquatics, they do a great job of sprinkling events all over the valley so that everybody's exposed to uh, these fun events plus the safety messaging that's there. Um, and so our partners usually uh, sponsor one, but they're 
held in, in all of the different districts, so everybody gets a chance to uh, get the water safety messaging. There's CPR that's taught there, information about uh, the swim lessons. Again, we take this SOS messaging there, CPR, DVDs that you have in front of you, English and Spanish again. Um, but not only do we use those events that are spread out uh, across the valley, we supplement those as we go into schools and educate them. Uh, the fire department itself, we visit annually about 30 schools and impact about 8,000 students. But it's not just the students that we're impacting because, again, this SOS messaging, all our water safety, it goes home. And in a way, we hope that it uh, infects the family, if you will, and they all get exposed to that. So um, that and then Buddy Bear uh, has even more visits than we do. So. So, so Buddy Bear is our, our mascot who... Uh, Where is Buddy Bear today? <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Bear He's is resting, getting ready for those swimming lessons for that registration that we're going to take place tomorrow. But he is very busy throughout the year. He, we, on average, visit about, make 150 visits annually and touch about 40,000 community members, whether that be a meet and greet, it could be a puppet show, it could be a water safety presentation. So Buddy Bear keeps busy, and it's our way to continually touch our community and talk about water safety and have that, that opportunity. I would like to take a moment to thank uh, Madam Chair and Councilman Nowakowski and Councilman Valenzuela for the opportunity to put together the SOS program. I think it is a really great uh, curriculum that we're able to share with our community to really educate our community on water safety and help with that downtick in those statistics that, that, are, that we've seen over the last 10 years. I think our dollars, uh, by putting efforts into this, are saving lives. So mm -hmm. I think that's the best well-spent dollar if we can save a life. So uh, thank you for your efforts. Thank you for all the work that you do because you guys are busy during the summer. <laughs> so appreciate the news. Thank, thank you. you for your thank you. Uh, we have uh, after school programs, item eight. Sit up here. Madam Chair and uh, members of the subcommittee, uh, today I have uh, Tracy Crockett, the Assistant Director of the Parks and Recreation Department here to talk about the programs that uh, are under her purview, uh, which are after school, uh, the after school programs, uh, Phoenix After School Center, as well as mobile recreation. So I'll turn it over to Tracy and her staff uh, to do the presentation. Good morning. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, today we're here to highlight two programs that service youth in after school settings um, at various locations that provide recreation and education. Um, so first here to discuss our PAC program, our Phoenix After School Center, I have Cynthia Aguilar, who's our Deputy Director for our Downtown Division. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Happy to be here with you to, pre uh, to present a brief presentation on the Phoenix After School Center program, more commonly known as PAC. PAC provides a safe and enjoyable environment for children 6 to 13 years of age during critical after-school hours, Monday through Friday, at 38 schools throughout Phoenix. Currently, 1,800 youth are registered, with over 1,400 of these children attending on a daily basis. PAC offers families a high-quality after-school program at an affordable rate. Fees range from $30 to $65 per session. For families who enroll for all four sessions, this comes out to $120 to $260 per year. We do have one site that is an exception to this in the Kyrene School District, which is a full cost recovery site. While PAC is an affordable option, we still have family or scholarships for families available in need of financial assistance, and those scholarships are made available through donations by local neighborhood groups and nonprofit organizations. Uh, here's a list of the current school district where PAC is currently being offered. Uh, there are two schools noted that are charter schools, that's Ameris Schools and ASU Prep. Over the years, a variety of criteria has been used to identify schools where PAC is offered. Uh, criteria includes a lack of other nearby affordable after-school program options for their students, schools' willingness to provide adequate space at no cost to the city, perceived need by the neighborhood, and also the percentage of free or reduced lunch rates for those schools. During the program, children participate in a variety of structured age-appropriate activities that focus on key program components, including educational enrichment, physical activity, arts and culture, 
civic engagement, and nutrition education. Daily activities are programmed around weekly-based themes to keep children interested and engaged. Weekly lesson plans are developed and provided to all 38 sites to ensure the program's quality and consistency amongst all 38 sites. Some program components such as homework assistance, physical activities, reading, and arts and crafts are delivered daily, while others such as STEM-related activities and nutrition education may be provided on a weekly basis. Activities are facilitated by trained recreation staff. Each PAC site is managed by an on-site recreation leader. This position serves as our on-site supervisor and also the key contact to parents and school administrators. Currently, PAC has allocated 127 part-time positions to manage these 38 programs. This staffing level allows us to maintain a maximum 1 to 20 staff to participant ratio. The overall program itself is managed by full-time recreation coordinators and a recreation supervisor who are in attendance today um, in the front row to my right. So I'd just like to recognize them for all the hard work that they do every day. Our parents continue to show they are very pleased with the quality of our program with close to 100% satisfaction in key areas such as safety, quality, and affordability. Annual surveys are also distributed to principals and participants to ensure satisfaction with the program. Uh, the current school year is getting ready to wind down, so we're preparing for the 2018-19 school year, and registration will begin for those programs on July 12th. Uh, parents can learn more about PAC by visiting phoenix.gov slash parks. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shantae, who's going to go into uh, another after-school program we provide. So I'll just briefly introduce Shantae. Shantae Johnson is a recreation coordinator, too, in our South Division. And so she oversees our mobile recreation, and she'll give you an update. All right, thank you, Madam Chair and subcommittee members. I'm happy to provide this update today. So just to begin with, the mobile recreation operates uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, we run from 4 o'clock to 7 p.m. And then we operate on the school year calendar, so we're on a set calendar with the school year. Now, the focus of the program is to visit parks that don't have an existing recreational program or a brick and mortar type of establishment. So it truly is mobile recreation in the sense that we deliver programs directly to sites that don't have uh, resources or that they are very limited. All right, so just a bit more uh, brief overview of the program. Uh, we have four themed recreational units. Those are our vehicles. Um, all four units were completed and in rotation as of this past September 2017. Uh, we initially started with just the sports unit in November of 2016. We operate at 20 parks monthly. Uh, you have an example of the calendar in your packet. And then we are consistently programming at this point. So each park is visited once per week by a different themed unit. So this is our consistency and uh, kids can know when to expect us on a weekly basis. Uh, we're currently averaging about uh, 155 kids weekly and we have reached out to overall participation numbers over 5,000. All right, so programming components. We'll dive a little bit further. So each of the uh, vehicles uh, were designed with a unique theme and programming focuses around that. So the Phoenix teams also aided in determining these themes as well. So THEM, of course, focuses on science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, our music, arts, and culture van, which we call MAC for short. Uh, sports, as you can imagine, is all things related to sports. It's fitted with gaming equipment uh, to play a number of sports. And then gaming. Gaming is really cool. It has a TV, gaming console, giant board games like Giant Jenga, uh, and all things gaming. Now, these are all intended to capture the varying interest of the, of the youth. And in addition to that, uh, connect them to important benefits. So our staffing, so current staffing levels, we're at full staff, uh, myself being the recreation coordinator, and then we have five recreational leaders and four recreational instructors. And then of course we utilize a number of partnerships to uh, aid in our program enrichment, 
um, including ASU, College Depot, Housing Department, and Arizona at Work, to just name a few. And then our year in a review. We've done a lot, but these are a few noteworthy points to uh, note about the mobile recreation program. Uh, coding. So Code Phoenix, we recently uh, launched this program in March. Uh, it's our pilot program that we are offering at uh, one site. Uh, it's an eight-week program, and we're teaching coding to kids out at the park site. So I named it Code on the Go. Uh, if you look at the pictures there, you can see they're outside with their laptops. The second picture is of them interacting in some what we call unplugged activities uh, to additionally learn uh, the coding concepts. Uh, and then special events. We participated in 12 special events this year, this fiscal year. Uh, we were able to interface with about 2,000 youth through the special events and outreach to the tens of thousands. Um, we participated in the APS Electric Light Parade, the Pride Parade, the MLK Festival. Um, we'll be at Dia De Los Niños this weekend and soon uh, out at 4th of July. And then moving from there, uh, lastly, state and national recognition. So these are just great things for the program. We have had our um, Arizona Parks and Recreation Association and our National Parks and Recreation Association. These are our professional associations. They've recognized the mobile recreation program for its uh, innovation. Um, and then we were able to tour uh, city of Tucson. They even came down and we provided them some demonstrations about our program and, you know, uh, gave them some insights about what we we're doing. And uh, just recently, even city of Tempe reached out to us um, to provide, you know, some insight and uh, mobile recreation and all that it can do. Um, so that pretty much sums it up. And so um, we are thankful with the uh, direction and support of the council that we're able to provide recreation and again education in diverse um, and various locations for our youth. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. I have uh, three uh, cards on item eight. And so I will uh, hear the uh, citizens that want to speak. Gloria Baldonado. Okay, wow. all right. Frank Montano. Frank, no, okay. <laughs> Maria Martinez. <laughs> Buenos días. Buenos días. Uh, yo soy mamá de un niño que participa en las actividades en el Parque Edison. Uh, Él ha estado cada lunes, cada constante. Van otros niños por él y muy contentos todos que para hacer las actividades. Yo le doy gracias por preocuparse por nuestros niños que muchas veces este, se quedan en la casa con sus juegos, con sus Nintendos, pero cuando van ellos, corren, juegan. Luego llega y dice, mira mamá, ahora hice una pulsera y esto. Ah, se emocionan y yo sé que Muchas mamás a lo mejor no tienen el tiempo y eso, pero a mí sí me preocupa. Mi niño lo veo muy contento con este programa. Él tiene nueve años y ahora le dije, no sé si ese evento siga. Dice, ¿por qué no? Dice, ese es muy bueno para nosotros. Dice, porque corremos, hacemos juegos, actividades. Y yo le quiero dar las gracias por por su apoyo para con nuestros niños y ojalá y en el futuro llega para más nuestros jóvenes donde estamos en el parque Edison llegan muchos jóvenes y también para que hagan más actividades para nuestra juventud porque ahí se juntan puros niños 6, 7, 8, 9 años y ya los más jóvenes, los más grandes tengo un niño de 16 años y dice no, yo no puedo ir porque hay puro niño chiquito Y ojalá ya haya más y muchas gracias. Mi niño está muy contento con este programa y espero ya haya más en el futuro para nuestros niños. Gracias. 
Good morning. I'm going to summarize. My name is Ariadna Valentin, and I work um, with the housing department. And she um, she resides at one of the housing sites. And um, she just wanted to uh, you know let you know that she is very grateful for the program. Her nine year old son participates, and he looks forward to um, Mondays uh, when um, the mobile van comes around to Edison Park. And so she's just um, I'm going to summarize it because it's not like everything she said, but pretty much she said. <laughs> Uh, she talked really fast, so I can't remember everything. Um, so pretty much she said that uh, she, you know, she's really grateful because she knows that this is a very much needed uh, resource in the area um, because there's a lot of kids that, you know, after school is very much needed. So her son and, you know, all the other uh, kids in the neighborhood, you know, look forward to going and attending. And, you know, like she, he always comes back with like a bracelet or just different thing, you know, different art activities that um, the van you know um, they, they do so she's just grateful and that she wishes that you know there's more programming not only for because she feels because she has also a 16 year old son and he feels like oh well can they like do more stuff for older kids because he feels like yeah you know it's nice but because he sees like a lot of the younger kids attend that he would like to see more um, activities for for the older um, you know, kids as well, but she's very grateful and would like to see this um, service being provided uh, for for the residents um, at at this at Edison Park that's located off of 20th Street and uh, Roosevelt. Pues gracias. Thank you. Um, that's a good question that she brought up because the intent of the mobile ban was so was for that age group. Um, for the disconnected youth of 14 to 21. So I would like to look at that programming because uh, the intent was to service areas uh, that, um, areas that didn't have any type of activity and service the community across the spectrum. Uh, originally started uh, the mindset was because the disconnected youth or the opportunity for youth came out and said, we don't have any school and we don't have anything for us. So that's an interesting um, comment uh, to be very cognizant because we must be serving the younger youth and not the, not the opportunity for youth. So I would like to look at that and the programming for those. Madam Chair, uh, we will look at that. The other piece is uh, the STEM mobile van should probably be situated or programmed or for 14 and up. Uh, so I wonder what the, the STEM van offers that the kids, which is good, I think is, is excellent, that the nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds are, are curious uh, enough to be exposed, but we probably look, need to look at our our curriculum to be able to expose the whole spectrum. Absolutely. Councilman Nowakowski. You know, I agree. I think that I have six children. They're the age from four to 16 years of age. And I know that our 13 to 16 year olds kind of hang out together and they kind of do their own little thing. And the, the four year old to 12 year olds kind of fit in a little group. So maybe when it comes to programming, I know that you all you all do that already. I know that we geared towards, what is it, seven to about 17 or so. And then um, I know that some of my kids participate at the Chavez one and that they do split them up in different groups and they have activities and stuff like that. But maybe um, we can start to educate the, the teenagers because sometimes when they see their little brothers go there and little sisters, they kind of shy away from that. But I think that's really important. Pero el programa, te quiero decir en español until they're in Spanish. Yo creo que el programa es para, para todas edades, ¿no? De 7 a 17 personas um, que son teenagers que le dicen en inglés. Y creo que es algo muy importante que digas a tu hijo que no tenga vergüenza que venga y que, que juegue con los niños también. Que ese programa es para todos, ¿no? Yeah. Sí. No, pero qué pasa es que muchos de los niños chiquitos van y los que son más grandes tienen vergüenza y... But the program is for you, too. Gracias. But also, it can give an example of all the little kids and teach them, too. One more. 
<laughs> so I was telling him that this program is really for everyone that, you know, sometimes being teenagers, you shy away from hanging out with the little kids, but they need to come in and, and they'll create some kind of a program for those older kids too. And, and then Laura was saying that maybe he can even become a mentor for the younger kids and, and participate as a mentor also. So programming was supposed to be designed with partners to also work on job applications, resumes, uh, even possibly personal statements. Doesn't sound like that. And Madam Chair and uh, members of the subcommittee, I'm gonna let Shantae talk about the partnerships we do have um, with some of the groups. So um, our partnerships in, uh, include, you know, partnerships with ASU. Um, we've also uh, partnered with College Depot. Uh, some of those programs, things as, as far as, as far as job related, um, are things that we're currently developing. As the program is still in its first year, we um, launched in September, and we're um, developing uh, or well, with all four units uh, and getting programming. Uh, that would include uh, teens as well. Okay. And programming we, was supposed to have been done. Yeah, pro it is done. It is done. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. yeah, programming so, is done. So I, I think one of the to, Madam Chair, programming should have been done for the teenagers. Yeah. I, I'm just the reason why I'm pushing back so hard is because I was a champion and worked very hard with the opportunity for youth population to develop this mobile van and. I'm just the programming exists, Madam Chair. A little confused. The program exists. I think what we have uh, difficulty in, kind of, uh, to what Councilman Nalkowski uh, noted, is sometimes it's harder to get the older kids there, and so we've had to adjust our programming. Um, but we need to get them there, and so we need to find ways to to encourage them to to come. So the program exists, um, and and we just need to we just need to make sure that we get the right age groups. We've had to make some adjustments when, if their kids come that are younger. We have to kind of adjust a little bit there, so if, if that's correct. Yes, it is. And uh, we have binders for each of the units that are programmed, so it is intended for, I mean, it's the Phoenix Teens Mobile Recreation, and these are things that we are, uh, imp um, I would say, adding to, making adjustments to, you know, do better at uh, reaching uh, teens as well, as that is the intention. Yeah, because the van's named Phoenix Teens. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, what I'd like to hear from you all is that we, we have the um, Phoenix Teen Mobile Rec out there for a year. It's been a, year, a pilot program for a year. What are the needs that you see that we can provide as a council? Because I think sometimes we start these great programs, and I know that the... Um, the, our chairperson for the subcommittee has been working very hard to make sure that there's program that there's a program behind it, educational components at the same time being fun for for teenagers. So saying all that, what can we do by providing resources or help to make it even, take it to that next level, right? Because it's been out there for a year. You guys worked out all the tweets. So now what's what else do you need? Yeah, I would just say additional um, marketing outreach uh, with the program, uh, getting to the uh, 20 different park sites, um, you know, by way of, uh, you know, digital uh, marketing is uh, extremely helpful uh, as we can't always get to all 20 of them. Like on foot, uh, we have done, you know, uh, walking through the, uh, through the, neighborhoods and things like that. Uh, and then also like just continu continuing to uh, be available to uh, join you in your community events uh, where we can outreach at the public, just ensuring that you know there's a process where you can reach out to us and request mobile uh, recreation to attend. Um, and that's a simple request form that you fill out. And those are great opportunities for us to uh, get the word out. So I may not always know about all of those different things going on, uh, if there's space for mobile recreation, but uh, those are just a couple of different ways that uh, help us get the word out. And Madam Chair, um, Councilman Nalikowski, we also can benefit from just, you know, any type of resources that you have community-wise or partnerships, because we do often run into um, youth that may not have a lot of resources and it, 
you know, outside of the recreation aspect. So if there are partnerships that you come across or those who may want to fund or scholarship some activities for these youth, we're looking for that. And then, of course, with any, any program that utilizes um, vehicles, you know, we're always trying to make sure our maintenance is, is strong and that our vehicles are running and that we're able to service those youth. So just the outreach awareness and, and uh, partnerships. Manager, may follow up. Um, what I like to see is maybe for each district that has a program or has a night, mm -hmm. if you can just give us a list and maybe what we mm -hmm. could do is through our email um, list that we have, our newsletters, yeah. our community meetings, we can actually start to share the, the program. Because I know that many people that I go out there and I, my kids play baseball, soccer, mm -hmm. football, and then you see the mobile unit out there and people are saying, what's that? They're not sure if they're able to go out there and, and engage or not. So maybe if we can have some more outreach on our part and help you all to spread that good news. Um, talking about the um, after school program, I know that um, some people are saying that there's even waiting lists, right, to get into the program. And um, is there anything else we can do to help dissolve or help? Money. Yes. <laughs> So thank you, yes, Council Member uh, Nowakowski, subcommittee members. Uh, one of the challenges is that they are part-time positions that we have currently. Um, so limited number of hours and benefits. So often the turnover rate uh, has been challenging for us because they leave for full-time employment or they uh, find full, uh, or they have a change in their school schedule. But we've uh, made great strides in that area. Um, we have. Uh, about 89% of our positions are filled right now, which is good. Um, and that vacancy rate that we've carried has been something that's been challenging for many years for us. But most recently, we've made some improvements in our hiring processes. So over the last few months, we've been able to work with HR and uh, have some direct on-site interviews with people. And it eliminated the need for people to have to go out and get on a formal list and wait to hear from us. So it's really expedited things. In the last few months, we've made a lot of progress in that area, um, and we're really happy with where we are with that. And that's consistent with part-time recreation kind of in general, too, those statistics. Now, is there a way, or is it because of benefits and allocation of resources that we can't have yeah, somebody working? Full we can have full-time doing dual, basically, responsibilities when working in a park doing something totally different than in, in the evenings working the PAC program or, or even the uh, mobile rec center. So Madam Chair and Councilman Nowakowski, um, in, in often cases like Shantae, um, you know, she's a full-time employee. Um, our PAC uh, folks are full-time employees and so um, that they're here today. Um, so when uh, there's a situation where maybe someone calls in sick, they sometimes have to pick up the slack in those uh, situations as well. Um, I think to, to your other point that I think we've talked about in the in the parks themselves, um, we do have um, several full-time employees um, who do both a community center um, and also uh, work at the various parks. Um, you know, a few of them. There's not multiple people, but uh, uh, over the years as we've lost staff, they, they've had to kind of take two and three centers um, as well as um, do the stuff in the parks as well. Good. Thank you. No problem. Um, I'm, may I suggest that we go back to the opportunity for youth group and get resources from there. That was uh, the intent uh, to work with uh, the county, to work with the city, all our city departments uh, to get what is needed in order to support these mobile units. Absolutely. I, I think we'd be remiss to, to not remind ourselves about the um, vehicles, we got those from some of the other departments too. And so that's how we were actually able to get the vehicle. So um, thanks to the fire department and also to public transit. I just got a text from Felicita, my assistant, saying that we do get a list of all the parks we do um, put on our Facebook. <laughs> so you so all awesome. are doing your job. Thank you. <laughs> we're just making you aware. We got it done already. Yeah, what's your, what's your okay, office I'm getting aware now. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Uh, item number nine is the Parks and Recreation Board agenda. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, uh, tomorrow is the Parks and Recreation uh, Board meeting. 
And uh, the items that we have, if I can get this thing, there we go. Information only items, uh, Hans Park update, the status of where we're at, where we're going to be going with getting community input. The roles and responsibility of the Parks Board members, we've had a couple new members, so we want to make sure they understand their roles and responsibility. The American Indians Veterans Memorial. Can I ask a question? Yes. Roles and responsibility, you're reviewing that because we had a new member who um, okay. didn't uh, necessarily understand what his roles and responsibilities okay. were, and so we want to make sure everybody's all on the same page. Got it. So we'll review the charter, that sort of thing with them. Okay. The American Indians Veterans Memorial at Still Indian School Park. This is a group that has an agreement with us several years ago and um, kind of uh, got silent for a minute, and now they're back, and they want to see about uh, putting the memorial there. Is it the USS? No. Uh, okay, this, that, this, this is a yeah. different group. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the proposal to ban smoking at parks, uh, we had a pilot uh, uh, program over at El Oso Park, and this group of youth, uh, students from uh, Trevor Brown, would like us to take it citywide, and so we're going to talk about uh, how that can happen. The Parks Preserve Initiative repayment update, we have that on every month as well. Information and discussion, uh, the city budget update, just to let everybody know where we're at uh, in the budget process, specifically with the Parks and Recreation Department. And as you may recall, there's two rangers that are uh, currently uh, noted in the budget uh, for helping with flatland parks. Consent items, um, farmer's market at Roadrunner Park, daring adventures, an operating agreement to uh, almost uh, go full circle. They started uh, as a city program and through budget reductions uh, lost the program, but a nonprofit kept it going. And they're, they're coming home, in a sense, to Telephone Pioneer Park. Rosalie Park master plan, uh, approval of the master plan that the community had uh, lots of input into what they wanted to see at their particular park. Uh, consent items continued. Uh, we have to go back. Mandan Street design was approved and it's in the preserve and it's to protect some homes uh, from flooding situations. They had to redesign it and it was significantly different from the first design so we're coming back for approval of that. Papago Golf Course uh, Road renaming, uh, that's going to uh, go before the board as well as a uh, group that will help us uh, get more golfers in. So a third-party online tee time uh, service provider called um, Golf Now. Policy items, uh, naming of a park at Reach 11, the Lost Lake Festival Park Hours extension, and then we added yesterday the IA Park renaming uh, resolution at, at the direction of the council to take it forward to the Parks Board. Uh, and with that, I'll answer any questions. I was, yeah, I was looking for that one because I didn't see it on my packet, but we added it on. Um, could you please kind of explain the proposal of the ban uh, to ban smoking at the parks and explain the pilot and uh, what the intent is? So uh, several years ago, two years ago, um, the uh, students, stand students from Trevor Brown came to us and wanted to do a pilot uh, near the playground because that park is situated between a high school and a grade school. And they uh, were seeing the effects of uh, possibly the, the observation of people smoking, but also the, maybe the negative effects of secondhand smoke, that mm -hmm. type of thing, uh, on their brothers and sisters and their younger siblings. And so they asked us to do a pilot. And so we did the pilot. Um, and we uh, noticed that there was a decrease when we put signs up that said, smoking was not allowed in the park. We know it's a decrease in cigarette butts and things of that nature uh, in the park. And so uh, the stand group from three or four other schools got together, and they came uh, to meet with uh, myself and, and some of our staff members to say, well, can we take this great idea and move it on to the rest of the parks? And so that's what the intent is now, is uh, to talk to the community about it. So we're just giving information to the Parks Board. We will talk to the community about it. We'll do some surveys in the various parks, um, especially those around high schools. Um, and we're trying to encourage more stand programs to come forward uh, so that we can really make this um, a, a valuable thing across the city of Phoenix. Now, I know they have a, Stan has a group statewide. I don't know how many groups are in the local urban area. We had three different schools uh, come, okay. and I think they're trying to expand that to other school districts. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions on the board agenda? I was just, I was going to ask because enforcement on that, can we actually enforce that, a ban, or is it just? Once, uh, once we gather and garner all the information, um, I do think it is something that we could take forward as an ordinance. Um, okay. You know, it is something that ha would have some uh, 
uh, legitimate teeth uh, if that's a direction that uh, the, the council wanted to go once we get the information. Uh, but I think it would have to be something that we could literally put teeth into to make it a, a successful project. Because I know that um, years ago I tried to um, ban um, cussing in the, <laughs> in the playground areas because of my children being there and, and just listening to young people just cursing all the time around little kids. And then they said that it was um, a person's constitutional right to... So I think we can maybe address some of those issues right. um, through code of conduct as well that we're also going to be working on through the summertime uh, because that, that's something we need to address as well. And I think that's maybe a, a little more, um, I hate to say subjective, but more subjective. Smoking is one of those things that obviously there's, there's statewide bans around you know, entrances to buildings and things of that nature. So it is something that I think would have a penalty with it maybe not cussing, but cussing, we can certainly say, you know, we're going to ask you to leave the park because that's not part of our code of conduct. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you, Inger. It's called to the public. I have no cards. Uh, future agenda items. Any? No? Nope. Maybe we oh. could put that, um, that petition on there. Oh, yeah, if, the petition. Well, what, I, I mean, if it doesn't go through whatever... If it doesn't go through the council or whatever, then oh, okay. we can you actually want it as an agenda item. An agenda okay. item seen if we allow um, um, marijuana dispensaries within so many feet from our libraries. The actual substance. Right, correct. right. Uh -huh. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, we'll add that to the agenda if it doesn't move through the other channels. All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.